Good evening, everyone. Good morning. Good day, everyone. I'll just wait for a few minutes for people to enter. I hope you're all well. I hope you've had a very, very good, enjoyable day and a few days at Virtual Stampex. It's really nice to welcome you all here. Right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, welcome to tonight's very last Stampex talk. Um, the whole series is now available in the Spink Auditorium. So if you've missed out, don't panic. Pop back in, watch them. Um, tonight's um, talk with Bill and Mike will also be there this evening. And I am really delighted to welcome two YouTube stars and lining grave experts, Bill Barrell and Mike Williams. So we will be taking questions at the end. So please do pop those into the Q&A box below. And now I'm going to hand over to Bill and Mike to talk to us about the line engraved stamps of Great Britain, 1840 to 1888, 1880. Over to you, Bill. 1880, Isabel. Thank 1880. you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel. It's a pleasure to be here. And what a success this, this virtual stamp X has been. Uh, I, I'm Bill Barrell, uh, dealer in Great Britain postal history and stamps, and also, and also, collector and exhibitor of Great Britain postal history and stamps. Uh, I'd like to thank you for scheduling us last, Isabel. I don't know whether we're, we're bringing up the rear or, or whether you've saved the best to last. But anyway, without any further ado, let's get going. So the line and growth stamps of Great Britain, 1840 to 1880. This is what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Why do we have the postage stamps? 1830s postal reform in the UK, the design of the world's two postage stamps, where did the design come from? The line engraved printing process, plate construction, the first plates, the change from penny black to penny red, the introduction of perforation, can look at uh, the introduction of perforation and its use. 1855, the old die is recut and we welcome die two. 1855, die two significant items, and then 1858 to 1864, change of design. What have we got postage stamps? Yeah, it's a question we don't always ask ourselves. Quite simply, they're there, they're there as a receipt for purchase of a post, postage service. They were introduced by, introduced by the Victorians who inherited, who inherited a very expensive and somewhat archaic postal system with very high charges, largely caused by the British government's need to raise money to pay for the Napoleonic War. It was a system based upon the mileage a letter had to travel, the number of sheets enclosed, the weight of the letter, prepayment was not compulsory, and, and to just complicate matters, there was a, a comprehensive free franking system for bishops, lords, uh, and, and, and peers, etc. Um, it was a system abused by many who, had, who enjoyed free mail, and it's estimated about 12.5% of mail was, free, free, was spent free of charge. That, that, that's a lot, that's a, a lot of income lost. So postal reform is needed. And, and to show that, I've got this letter at the bottom here, which is 1826. It's traveled 47 miles, Glasgow to Edinburgh, postal charge of 20 shillings and five pence, weighs eight and three quarter ounces, charged 20 shillings and five pence, which in today's money, 2,050 two pounds. We need postal reform. 1930s in the UK, was a period of great reform, of great social reform. Roland Hill, he has a vision, which he outlines in a very, very important pamphlet, post office reform, its importance and practicability. He suggests a low uniform postal rate based upon weight and postage should be prepaid. So postal reform is on the way. The first period of postal reform December the 5th, 1839, a new scale of postage is introduced and the highest charge for a letter not exceeding half ounce is fourpence, but prepayment is not insisted upon. Second stage of postal reform, 10th of January, and probably the most important stage of postal reform, that, that um, high rate, that, that, that postal rate for mail not exceeding half ounce was reduced from, poor, from, from fourpence to a penny. That's if it was paid or it was charged double, i.e. toppence upon delivery. So prepayment is not encouraged. 
and a receipt for this prepayment was needed. So, any ideas what was used as a receipt for prepayment? What we've got here on the left is an original postal notice, and that right is a first, first day usage of the uniform penny. So we have the need for a receipt for prepayment. What do they do? They came up with a little sticky piece of paper, which, which we now know as postage stamps. The third stage of postal reform, 6th of May, saw the introduction of two stamps, penny black and the topney blue. The cover here on the right is a very well known first day cover, penny black first day used on the 6th of May. It's a particularly fine example. It's clearly dated, it's clearly dated inside 6th of May, and it's got a very clear back stamp. What is also nice is that the back stamp, the Cornhill local usage hand stamp in London and the Maltese Cross are in the same shade of ink, totally genuine. It's got a great provenance, and for those, for those interested in May dates, there's a fantastic book by Mike Jackson uh, called May Dates. He has produced a survey of Penny Blacks, Topneys, Moreddies, caricatures used during May. He records the, this, uh, this cover and he gives its provenance. And the provenance, which is very interesting, um, it first came on the market in 1951 in, uh, a, Robson, no, in a Harmer sale where it sold for the grand sum of 77 pounds, 10 shillings. The next uh, comprehensive detail is October 1963, in that dear, that dear old auction house, Robson Lowe, when they auctioned the well-known uh, Morris Burris collection, who was a very wealthy Swiss collector, where it fetched 130 pounds. So, so we have the three stages of postal reform. 5th of December, a uniform Fortney rate. 10th of January, a uniform penny rate. And on the 6th of May, we have the stamps introduced. One item I'd like to show you here, which shows the world's first two stamps, is a most unusual turned cover. Its, it's, its first journey was from London to Saxmundham, where they used the Topney value, presumably, double rate because it had enclosures. It was then turned inside out and it was sent back from Saxman to London with a penny value. It's a, it's a great cover sh showing the world's first stamps on it. Where did this design come from? Well, this, this, this is a, a charming image courtesy of Royal Mail Group, care of the Postal Museum, which, show, which shows a sketch. You can clearly see signed by Roland Hill in 1839 where he's, he's, his idea, his core idea, involves the Queen's head, postage at the top, one penny at, one penny at the bottom, and very interestingly, check letters at the bottom there, P for Papa, B for Bravo. I'm assuming they're the initials of the printers uh, of the subsequent issues, Perkins Bacon. So that was his embryonic idea. How did it translate into stamps? Well, if, if we look at all the line engraved stamps of Great Britain, the penny black, the topney, the penny, the halfpenny, the penny halfpenny, the head, that beautiful engra engraving of the Queen's head is taken from the 1837 William Wyre medal to celebrate the Queen's visit to the city of London. The background, the engine term background, is taken from this central band on a 1820s banknote plate produced by Perkins Bacon in an attempt to win a banknote uh, contract. So we have head, background equals the design. So how, how were the stamps printed? Well, all of the stamps were printed using the line engraved printing process. Some of you might know it as intaglio or recess or line engraved. It's the same printing process whereby the plate is engraved with recesses, some shallow, some deep, some shallow, some deep. Those recesses are then filled with ink, and then that ink is then transferred to the paper and the printed, and the printed image appears. So what we have to remember, the key word is recess. If you've not got, if, if there's no recess on the plate, it will not pick up any ink. Recess equals printed image, all right? How did they make the plate? Having selected the design, an engraver was commissioned 
to engrave in negative, i.e. recess, a printed image. That printed image in negative was then transferred to a transfer roller in a positive image. That positive image was then rocked into a blank steel plate under pressure and that would create the recesses in the plate to retain the ink. Are, are we ready for printing yet? Not quite. That design that was rocked into the early line engraved stamps was complete in every, uh, every perspective except it did not have the check letters in the lower squares. These were manually, these were manually inserted. Here's a picture from the Perkins Bacon, uh, a, a tremendous book on, on, called the Perkins Bacon Records, uh, showing the orig an, an original holder with a letter which was then inserted through that end, uh, the, 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 end the end hole, and then, then the check letters were manually inserted into the lower squares. 12 horizontal rows of 20. First row was lettered AA, AA, AB to AL. The second row, BA to BL, and so on. These, these letters are a real help to collectors because one, you can collect your own initials, and secondly, secondly, they're a great assistant with plating because the check, the check letters were not put in uniformly. Here we see a misplaced T on Totney Blue plate four. We have a, a square J here and a round J, a very misplaced D. So there's lots of fun in looking at the letters. However, a major error occurs when they are inserting the check letters into the lower squares. 1847 on die one plate 77. That's not the very, very rare plate, but the very rare plate 77 is the one with the check with the letters in all four corners. This is the earlier plate 77. The engraver, when he was working on the first stamp, second row, lettered B A, he totally, totally forgot to put the check letter A in. It was not noticed. Printing occurred. Sheets were released to the public. It was then noticed. The A was inserted and printing continued. However, a small quantity of these stamps got out to the public and to date, 28 examples are recorded, all used. There's no mint examples. There's one on cover, five on piece, 22 singles. 11 are used in London, four in Scotland, etc. And this, which I have to say is one of the pride and joys of my collection stroke exhibit, is the only one used in Ireland. It's, it's considered to be the finest example and it's it's an amazing it's amazing uh, stamp variety. So we've now got a plate with the letters inserted. The plate is finished and Perkins Bacon take a proof sheet called the imprimatur. This is a copy of one from the uh, National Postal Museum records and here we have three genuine examples from plate 1A, plate 2, plate 5. Note that the impressions are very sharp. It, it, it's that they are the first stamps pulled from that plate. Not easy to tell from a very fine mint stamp. And so an imprimatur is always purchased with a, either a Royal or a BPA certificate. So we're ready to start printing. 11 plates were used for the penny black. Plate one, plate one was taken from the printing press and totally re-entered and exists in two states. Plate one A and one B. What do I what do I mean by re-entry? Well, what, what what happens is that transfer roller that transfer roller is totally re-entered into every impression of the plate. Occasionally, occasionally the the roller uh, coincides with the original design. Usually, usually there's a doubling of the design, and and the re-entry marks are very very clear. Here we see one of the classic major re-entries on. Uh, 1847 plate 75, where the doubling occurs and gives the image of a flag, and that's called the Union Jack major re-entry. Is it possible to plate the penny black? Yes, it is, and it's pretty easy. How can I plate a penny black? Well, constant varieties um, are produced by the, the printing process. There's a wonderful book produced by Charles Nissen, who was one of the original uh, pioneer philatelists uh, and involved with Litchfield and McGowan in completing the original 
uh, understanding of the penny black and and uh, what every impression on every plate looked like, which they did by overlapping plated blocks to, to fill the gaps. So these th these books are available. Uh, if anyone's got any problems plating blacks, just email me. Uh, I'll be very pleased to help. The, the, the issued stamp is that there's some nice uh, penny black multiples. Um, the colour looks a bit odd. Uh, that's because th these are in my collection at the moment. This one was a recent purchase, uh, and I've had to lift the... Uh, copy from a, an, the auction catalogue I bought it from. So it's, it's, it's a, bit, a bit odd. Okay, um, black used on cover. There's a couple of nice pieces there. Plate four and plate 10. This plate 10 cover, strip of five, very unusual. Plate 10 is, it's not the rarest plate. We'll come on to that in a minute. It's the second, second scarcest plate. And this is the largest known plate 10 piece used on cover. When it was sold in 1990 in the Selenid Atkinson um, collection who was uh, I, I met him several times in in my early days uh, working for Stanley Gibbons um, he, he had a wonderful display at uh, London 1980 and this would have been in his exhibit and at that time it had six stamps someone someone who purchased it at the auction or afterwards has cut off the six stamp which was damaged it kind of takes a little bit off the cover but it's still the largest known strip from this plate okay the the rarest plate, Penny Black, is plate 11, but it's not. It's not black. Um, it's usually in a grey-black shade. If you compare this impression here from plate 2, this is what we call the black. These two impressions here are from the, the much scarcer and fabled uh, plate 11 in a, much, in a very distinctive grey-black shade. So Perkins Bacon and the Inland Revenue have gone to great lengths to produce these stamps. Did people try to cheat the in and revenue out of paying for postage? Yes, they did. Here's a fascinating little newspaper clipping dated May the 7th. This is the day after the stamps have been issued. Someone is writing to the editor of the Times. Sir, this stamp came on a letter from Manchester and has been placed on the outside of this and directed to you to show it can occasionally be used again. So as early as early as May the 6th stroke May the 7th, we see someone reusing the stamp. The Inland Revenue were obsessed by loss of revenue. So in June to August 1840, a series of colour trials were conducted to, ex to explore a change of colour for the penny value. Uh, they've been called the rainbow, uh, they're called the rainbow trials because of the lovely, lovely range of colours there, blues and pinks and they're, they're, they're lovely items. Um, so we have the rainbow trials and a new colour is selected for the penny value. The colour they choose is red and that is issued to the public February the 10th, 1841 and this is a nice postal notice. Um, it is one. It is. It does belong in one piece. It was just scanned in, in two halves for, for ease. This is a postal notice sent to the postmasters to say we've got a new stamp. Cancel it with black. The first penny reds were printed from seven of the original penny black plates: one b, two, five, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. Now it's possible to match them. You can get the same same lettering, same lettering in the lower squares, same plate, but in black and red. What I've done here is I put together a match quartet, match quartet from plate eight, all lettered Bravo Delta, Bravo Delta, Bravo Delta, Bravo Delta. We've got Penny Black with a red Maltese cross, Bravo Delta, Penny Black with a black Maltese cross, Bravo Delta. And the rare one is plate eight, of course, with red Maltese cross, Bravo Delta. And then the, the, run, the run to the litter, the Penny Red with the black Maltese cross, which is, the, I, I was, uh, uh, I was amazed that I could do that and um, I, if, if you want a challenge out there what I would say is first first find the red on red and then match the other three because if you start with that one and try to find those three you've got no chance. So the first plate uh, used solely in red was plate 12 and here's a selection of mint, mint pieces. Plate 13 which is a very rare plate largest known block X Seymour another nice block X Seymour and Atkinson. Now, all of these stamps were imperforate and separated from the sheets using scissors. Separating stamps using scissors, very, very time-consuming exercise. So in the late 1840s, 
an Irishman, Henry Archer, made his first attempts at separation based upon rouletting, which is cutting a series of little uh, cuts between the stamps to aid separation. Wasn't very successful. This is a very rare pair from plate 71. He, he 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 was he was not uh, you know he, he was not put off and he continued with perforation experiments and he successfully achieved the uh, idea of perforating stamps using a perforation sixteen a perforation six uh, perforation sixteen machine which he he sold to the Indian Revenue. Now th these archer experimentational uh, issues are really quite quite scarce and sought after. How can you tell the difference from the later uh, perforate 16 stamps. Well, what you've got to look for, obviously a perforation stamp, you've got to look for the very small alphabet one check letters. Very, very small. And, and if, if you find a combination of perforation, alphabet one check letters, unless it's a forgery, you've got an archer perforation. During the 1850s, we see a very peculiar attempt at perforation called the treasury roulette, so called because a number of examples were found, although I've never seen any, uh, on letters from the Honourable Gladstone when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Again, these can be forged, so must be purchased with an RPS or a BPA certificate. Following Henry Archer's successful trials, the world's first, the world's first perforated stamps were put on sale 24th of February 1854, perforation 16. Perforation 16 caused problems because the sheet started to split. So they introduced perforation 14 in January 1855, where you have 14 dots per two centimeters, not 16 dots per two centimeters. Perforation was a great success, but perforation errors did occur. And here I'm showing you some very, very unusual, well, all right, very rare, uh, imperforate free side examples, and a most peculiar example here, with two perforations upper right, two upper left. Very, very odd. Um, right, let me just go back. Okay, but not all sheets were suitable for sale to the public. There was an element of quality control, and a post office employee named Frank I. Scudamore was given a hand stamp, Frank I. Scudamore, chief examiner, and he was instructed to apply this hand stamp to sheets that were not suitable for use. Now, until the mid 1990s, this hand stamp was only known on a few Topney Blues and a shilling green embossed. And then in a Sotheby's auction, a whole, a whole raft of these came on the market. I love them. I bought a lot of them and I added a few to my own collection. 1855, the old die, which was engraved in 1840, is starting to show wear. It's only show wear on the impressions. You can see this stamp here. This is an extreme example, but it's showing you how the, the, the printed image is losing its definition. So the old die was re-engraved. The, the, the queen's head is being retouched, deepened, and we have a new set of plates and they are called now we're now called die two so we have a die one of which there were 210 plates or so and then we start with die two die two plate one again this is an interesting cover showing a combination of die ones and die twos very sought after cover uh, a very sought after type of usage where you have the older die ones here then you have the the, the much stronger impression so if, if you if you want to you know a quick comparison on the two dies. You've got a die one, die two, which, which to my eye, my mind is a lot sharper. At the, well, soon after die two was introduced, they introduced a larger, a larger crown watermark. And here's a most unusual piece of unused paper. Prior to this, they've been using small crown watermark. Here we have large crown watermark as a greater aid to the fight against forgery. The, the Inland Revenue, who controlled stamp design, were absolutely obsessed by loss of income, as the tax man is today, I suppose. <laughs> now, what I'm going to show you now are a few items, uh, six or seven significant items from my, my exhibit, uh, which are all die two pieces. Here we see the work of Frank Ives Scudamore again, 
and this is this is quite incredible it's a block of 60 from die two when when Sotheby's had the auction there were quite a few blocks this size but many many have now been split down this delightful chap up here is Robson Lowe who I only met once uh, I met him once in a in a Christie's when I was viewing a Christie's auction um and i couldn't 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 believe it because he, he to, to people you know of, of perhaps my father's generation robson low was the 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 doyen of, of philately stamps and he he really drove and created the market for postal history he he went in in the uh i think his late 50s or 60s he went to a show in london and he found this cover which he said is possibly the rarest piece known in line engraved great britain an imperforate strip of six die two these stamps should have been perforated but through an adjustment to the perforation an incorrect adjustment of the perforating machine they are imperforate and they were used on a cover to australia it survives now i think that there are better covers than this obviously because he was speaking from the 19 60s and he wouldn't have known for instance of the famous Lord Buccleef cover where you have the only cover known with a penny black a topney blue and a penny red on which that has to trump that one by a long way uh, but it's, it's it's a great item another another item I'd like to show you is a quite remarkable used block of 38 die two pennies plate 13 with the OXO cancellation which has been used in the British Post Office set up in Constantinople to cancel mail from the troops serving in the Crimean War back to Blighty. Um, and it's 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 a it's an incredible piece. It's had a couple of stamps removed here, unfortunately, but I'm on I'm on the hunt for those. These are some very interesting pieces, mint blocks with plate numbers in the corners, which are particularly sought after and rare. This particular block here. Uh, was purchased by my late father, who uh, was very much a very keen stamp collector. Uh, he purchased it in Robson Low years ago, and is ex the personal collection of Dr. Wiggins, who was uh, one of who was a pioneer collector. A collection of plate by two plate twenty seven, remarkable plate. Over a million, a million sheets were printed. These are, these show a major re-entry in various states blue paper, white paper, transitional, small crown, and, uh, and, and the unique imprimatur. I couldn't turn these down. Um, when the Maury was introduced in 1840, it wasn't very popular. Here's one used in 1860, very late usage, with a penny star on, uh, which I believe is, uh, I'm told by Carl Louis, uh, it's, uh, it, it's unique. This is a facsimile, but a very nice page to match, I thought. A couple of years ago, there was a major sale uh, by Spink, the Chartwell Collection, who was a very wealthy uh, British industrialist, and it was full of lots of very nice pieces. And th th this is a, uh, a mint block of 1857 rose red on white paper with plate numbers and the full margin inscription at top. Beautiful piece, lovely colour. Obsessed with uh, um, fraud, the Inland Revenue, well, at times that th they were right. Here's a very interesting cover here, 1854. Now, if you look here, it's it's split into two. It's split, in, split into two stamps. It's the two remaining halves um, of stamps where the other half has been cancelled, put together. But it's not been done very well because they've not overlapped it. And if you look at the bottom, one is fine, but penny is spelt P E E N N Y. Now, in every dictionary I've ever used, penny is just got one one E in it. So there's a change of design. Letters in all four corners are introduced as an aid to, for, uh, as an aid to fight forgery. Nice cover with showing the old design and the new design. The new design is introduced and is a, a, it's a stunning piece. Um, 1867, there was an exhibition in Paris and the Board of Inland Revenue um, decided to supply the general post office who were at the exhibition with sa samples of their work and they requested um, a block of 20 in black blue and rose pink I believe is the other shade this is the unique block of 20 penny plate numbers that went to the Paris uh, exhibition and that uh, that really brings us to the end of this um, of this chat there's loads more I, I could show you um, but the, the last picture that, that's that's me there.
That to me there uh, is a picture taken at the incredible Royal Philatelic Society, Philatelic Jamboree in, in Stockholm last year, where I plucked up courage and I exhibited, I exhibited my GB line engraved and I got a gold medal. So that's, that, that, that's me, I'm Bill Barrell. If you've got any interest in GB line engraved, always pleased to hear from you. Any queries, I am very, very user friendly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, and now we're going to hand over to Mike. Please don't, also, please don't forget as well, please do put some questions in the Q&A for Bill. And also Mike will be taking Q&A at the end of the presentation. Thank you, over to Mike. Good evening, everyone. Whatever time of day it is, uh, day or night it is for you. I'd like to talk to you about some technical details that help to identify some of the penny red stamps that were printed and perforated, uh, printed by Perkins, Bacon and Co between 1854 and 1879. You might already be aware of some of these, but I hope you'll all find something new and of interest to you. I've collected the GB perforated stars since 1970, and I can tell you there is still much more waiting to be discovered about them. The first thing I'd like to talk about relates to a basic detail of the design of the penny stamps. GB line engraved collectors know that Perkins Bacon had to make a new die in 1854. This was because the old die that had been in use since 1840 and which by 1854 had made over 200 plates, was worn out. Many of you will recognise these images in the current Stanley Gibbons catalogue that show the differences between the two dies. However, there's another difference between them that I first noticed and wrote about nearly 30 years ago now. Here's the article I wrote back in 1991 in the GB Journal. It describes two short but strong lines in the Queen's hair on all the stamps of die two. Here's a close up view. These lines are particularly helpful for two reasons. First, they're in a new part of the head, away from all the other recorded differences. So if, if those are covered by postmarks, the hair lines are often still visible. Also, the hairlines are very helpful on worn prints from the early die two plates, which are so often wrongly identified as die one stamps. The lines often show up more clearly on these worn prints than they do on strong early prints. Here are the two dies side by side. I find these hairlines very easy to see and I now use them as my go-to check every time. So that's why I'm recommending them to you Hopefully you too will find them a quick and easy method of identifying the die of your stamps. I'd like to follow on by showing you another hair related detail, this time for collectors of the 1864 penny plate number series. These varieties were shown to me by my good friend and mentor Winston Hollins, who for me is the all time leading authority on these plate number stamps and much more besides. Here's the close up of the hair on a normal penny plate stamp. Look at the same place as you were looking when comparing the two dies. Now look at the hair on this stamp from plate 134. There are some extra heavier lines at the left of the hair under the S and T of postage. Then there's another change in hairstyle on plate 198 to 201. These plates show strongly recut lines under the S and T of postage. Here are the three hairstyles sewn together. The retouching was probably done by hand, although the exact method is still unknown. The retouched hair is only found on plates 134 and 198 to 201, which are an oddly numbered grouping, but it is one example of the hidden interest that this group of plates holds. There is still much to learn and this issue will surely repay anyone who wants to look more closely at something other than just the plate number at the side. We'll now move on to our second topic 
which is applicable only to the perforated stumps, although the cause of it was present on plates of the imperforate period. This feature is called tilt. I noticed, I first noticed it several years ago, although it took me a while to realize how important it is as a plating aid. Tilt shows as a twisting of the whole design of the stamp within the perforations. It can vary in degree and can be either clockwise or anti-clockwise, or if you're in North America listening to this, counterclockwise. Here's a block of stamps from die one plate 175 that shows quite strong anti-clockwise tilt. You can see that each stamp is twisted in its perforations and is therefore lower than its neighbour on the right. This feature occurs on many later die one plates and many of you will have noticed it on the Tupney blue plate four. It also occurs on several die two plates. The second block from die two plate 67 shows clear clockwise tilt, each stamp being higher than its neighbour to the left. Clockwise tilt is found on many die two plates but on only one die one plate. This third image shows a block from die two plate 49 that shows no noticeable tilt. The impressions are lined up level with each other and each stamp is square within its perforations. Such alignment was what Perkins Bacon were aiming for, but the machinery of the 1850s was just not up to the job and so they found it very difficult to achieve correct alignment. They managed to achieve it on only a handful of die one plates, although they, although they did improve later on. Almost half of the die two stars plates show no discernible tilt. Plate 49 may have shown no tilt, but don't think that there wasn't a problem with it. Of the three plates we've looked at, only one was rejected as unfit for perforation. And yes, it was plate 49. The reason for the rejection can be seen if you look closely again at this block. Look at those very narrow vertical gutters between first the G and H columns and secondly the I and J columns. As a result of these narrow columns there was a problem perforating the far right side of the sheet from this plate. Although the G column is well centred, the J to L columns are badly off centre to the left. Plate 49 was put to press in early April 1857 while Perkins Bacon were using borrowed premises in Savoy Street. But the fault with the alignment was quickly noticed and the plate was taken from press by late May after only a few weeks use. However, a note dated 8th of September 1857 reads, Plate 49 found regular enough for perforation. With this reprieve, the plate was put back to press again at the very end of 1857 and it remained in use for a further three and a half years. However, Perkins Bacon had moved back to their own premises by this time and the colour of the stamps was now very different from that of the first printings. The early pale Savoy Street shades from plate 49 are scarce and much sought after. The exact cause of tilt is not known for certain but we can have a pretty reasonable guess. It is that the roller was not aligned exactly straight when it was rolled into the plate. Each impression was therefore rolled in at a slight angle to the direction of travel of the roller, although it was parallel to its neighbours. The whole sheet would therefore appear to be slightly non-rectangular compared to any of the stamps on it. When the sheets were perforated, they were aligned using pinning marks in the middle of the top and bottom selvages. So the angle of the impressions on the sheet did not of itself affect the perforation process in any way. The only result of the misalignment was the tilt evident in the issued stamps. As we've seen, tilt varies from plate to plate depending on the alignment of the impressions. Knowledge of the tilt shown by each plate will enable platers to use it as a shortcut to plating. It can also be used as a final check on the plating achieved by other methods. I now routinely check that the tilt on any stamp I'm plating is in line with what I expect. And if not, I'll double check the plating. Very occasionally, perhaps when a sheet was fed into the perforating machine slightly askew, 
the tilt on a stamp is not typical of that plate. However, tilt is a good guide for over 99% of the stamps. The final point I want to cover is on the subject of fades. Most collectors know that the penny red stamps were printed in red brown from 1841 to early 1857. Then, on 11th of March 1857, Perkins Bacon's premises suffered a fire. They were able to borrow space in the Savoy Street premises of Messrs Whiting printers, and they printed their stamps there from mid-March to late June. Many of the shades produced early in the Savoy Street period were very pale. These can sometimes be difficult to see, let alone to plate. And by the way, there's a video on Bill's website that will show you how to get round this problem. As time went by, the Savoy Street shades gradually became deeper and eventually they became the well-known rose red shade that continued in use after Perkins Bacon returned to their own Fleet Street premises in July 1857. However, paler shades, similar to the 1857 shades, returned in the 1860s. How can you tell these later Fleet Street pale shades from the 1857 Savoy Street pale shades if your stamp isn't on a cover or piece and has no date on it? Well, let's see some answers to that question. Here's a scan of a page from my own display, which I'll now break down into smaller sections. The first thing to do is to plate the stamp. The plates in use in the 1860s were mostly different from those used at Savoy Street in 1857. If your stamp comes from one of plates 31, 37, 38, 40 or 53, it must be an 1857 printing because none of those plates were still in use after mid-1858. Plate 49 does occur rarely in paler shades after 1857, but most Plate 49 pale prints will be from the 1857 printing. If your stamp is from one of Plates 39, 41, 42, 46, 48, or any plate after Plate 55, it must be an 1860s printing, as none of these plates was in use at Savoy Street. If your stamp is from one of the eight remaining plates, 27, 34, 36, 43, 44, 47, 52 or 55, it could be from either printing. So with these eight plates, we have to use other evidence as pointers to help us decide whether the stamp is an 1857 or 1860s print. If your stamp is from one of those eight plates, you'll have to do further checks, as I say. The next thing to do is check the watermark. There were two types of large crown watermark. Type 2, which is first known dated in mid-1860, gradually superseded Type 1, although the Type 1 paper was only used up late in 1862. However, if your stamp has Type 2 watermark, it must be an 1860s print. If it has Type 1 watermark, it could be from either printing, so we must go on to the third method. For this group. The last thing to do is to look at the postmark, assuming that the stamp has one. In 1857 many of the postmarks were experimental types, such as sideways duplex or spoon types. In London the diamond in bars postmark was prevalent. By the 1860s the postmarks generally had much heavier bars and most of the sideways duplexes and spoons were no longer in use. Here are examples of each type including some from London. The keen-eyed among you will notice that the 1860s shades are also a bit pinker. The 1860s shade is actually called rose pink in the specialised catalogue, whereas the 1857 shade is called pale rose. If after using these three checks you're still unsure, you'll have to put this down to experience or use what experience has taught you previously and make an informed guess. Practice is important with these shades, so if you can, study dated items first before moving on to the more difficult undated stamps. There's one last thing I would like to say about pale shades. Over the years, many rose red stamps have been damaged by exposing them to ultraviolet light uh, rays in sunlight. The ink of these stamps is metal based, and these inks fade very badly if left in sunlight. This change is irreversible. The resulting shades are pale, but they are generally much duller than the true pale shades we've been talking about. 
My parting advice is therefore, never leave your penny red stamps where sunlight can damage them. And remember, the sun's rays can bounce around a room and destroy a stamp even if it's not in direct sunlight. So keep your treasures well stored away unless you are looking at them. That's all. If you would like any further information on any of the points raised in this talk, I can be contacted by email at bathcover at hotmail.co.uk or via Bill Barrel. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Mike. That was absolutely excellent. Thank you. Um, have we got Bill there as well? And we've got we have, a yep. little bit of time for some questions. <laughs> How about um, that for time though, man? Oh yeah, brilliant, well done. Um, so please keep putting your questions into the um, Q&A. We'll try and answer as many as we possibly can. There's actually quite a few here already. Um, so this one's from uh, Nicholas Rust. Um, what I wanted to ask Bill uh, was how he sees the market currently and what his advice would be on how to advise a collector who likes spending money but won't be able to compete at international level. How can I best spend to expand but still leave some residual value in my collection? And then Bill, he adds a little note further down. Um, he says, um, I meant in line engraved area, I collect 1841 1D reds onwards. Hi Nicholas, it's nice to hear from you. I think we've corresponded in the past. Uh, the, the market at the moment is incredibly strong. Um, you know, this, this virtual stamp X, we've had it, incredible demand for postal history, blacks, reds, covers, cancellations. Um, what, what, what can the collector do with uh, a, perhaps a more limited budget? I, I would say, I would say you learn your topic. You buy your books and you learn your topic and you find a, a, special, a, a nice little niche area to collect. P -p perhaps, perhaps it will be, um, I mean, Shades. I mean, some of some of some of the items that Mike has found, and Mike's got a far better knowledge than myself. He's found some amazing rare pieces, um, you know, which haven't cost him that much money because of knowledge. Knowledge in line engraved is everything. Does, does that answer most of the queries, Isabel? Yes, I think it does. Yeah. So th th there was quite a lot in that question. There was quite so, a lot in that. Yeah. So, so, so the market is very strong. I mean, we, we, we're kind of waiting to see what Gibbons are going to do with the Queen Victoria Specialised Catalogue, which comes out in November. And I've heard that, you know, kind of May date prices are coming down. But, you know, I, I'd be surprised if, if there's, if there's um, many, many changes be, be, because the, the demand is very good. You know, I, I, I before COVID, I used to travel the world doing shows, and you know, I go to Japan. The learning grade, the demand for learning grade was was great. In America, it's really strong. In Canada, there are some fantastic collections there, and and of course, UK and Europe. You know, it's 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 uh, you know, it's it, it's it's a very strong hobby. You know, and and I, I myself, you know, I I wouldn't be. I, mean, I spend quite a bit, quite a bit on my exhibit, a minor money on my exhibit, as you can see. Now, if I thought, you know, there was no future in the hobby or or in putting money into stamps, I wouldn't be doing it. That's for sure. I hope that answers your questions, Nick. If you've got any queries, then I, you know, I'm always pleased to 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 hear from you. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, we've got one here. Um. Uh, from an anonymous uh, attendee, it says, um, for the support of a novice and intermediate collectors, would you considering ad consider adding a list of books that you feel every GB collector should have in their library? And then they've just put a note. Thank you so much for the wonderful and highly informative presentation. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, can you just clarify which area they want information on books, maybe? Um, is, is, is it just GB? Yes, they've just put GB collector, every, Phil, every GB collector should have in their library quite a... Okay, um, well, okay. I mean, okay. I know you had a... I know you had a list of books in the, at the end of your presentation. At yeah, I point. did, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I have got a, I've probably got four to five hundred books in, in, in my library here. The, the essential books, okay, if you're interested in, in, in GB, you've got to start with, I, I'm assuming we're looking at a little bit of specialisation. OK, so your key your key starting point has to be your Stanley Gibbons specialised catalogue. OK, uh, the, the Queen Victoria, the, the Queen Victoria catalogue. Oh, you can't see it. 
No, the the um, Queen Victoria Specialised Catalogue, which is coming out, I think, in November, has to be a major purchase. That's the first one. Other books I would recommend that are excellent books by the Royal Philatelic Society called the, the Postage Stamps of Great Britain, that they produced a set of four stamps. They're, 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 they're a bit historical now, but the content is key. You know, they might be out of print, but they're not out of date. Uh, other, other, other key books, it really, it really depends on your area. I mean, if you, if you want, if you're interested in blacks, you've got to have, you've got to get hold of some Nissan photographs and some uh the, the book by litchfield if you want penny reds the the, the key book the, the the key resource has to be copies of the imprimatur sheets which i can supply uh many years ago in the, in when i set my business up in 1984 with the first money i made i went along to the national post and museum and i wrote out a check in 1984 i just set my business up for four and a half thousand pounds and i bought a complete set the last set they had of the high quality um, reproductions of the imprimatur sheets. That's the primary source for plating. And this, they are available in disc format if you want to contact myself. If you're looking for surface printed issues, again, the Queen Victoria, the, the Gibbons catalog, you know, I, I mean, Gibbons get, you know, you're either pro Gibbons or you're not. I, I'm pro Gibbons, you know, they're the market leaders. Um, they, they they produce an excellent range of books, so I'd start with the Gibbons books. I really would. Brilliant, thank you, Bill. That's really and, and, helpful. Again, if anybody out there, if you want advice on, for instance, on if you're looking for some information on, say, Scots local cancellations, there's a very good book by um, Alcock. If 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 you want if, if you want details on books, I might not be able to supply them, but I can certainly give you the titles. Okay, I'll be pleased to help you. I hope that I hope that helps. Um, so following on from books, we've got um, someone asking, um, I know that there are books to assist plating, but this gentleman, Adrian's wondering, are there any computer applications? Mike, I would add that Mike does all my plating. He's he's one of the leading platers. So I'm going to bounce that question over to you, Mike. The, um... Things I use online for plating are there are scans of the imprimatur sheets available by lettering or by sheet for all the issues of the penny red. There are also uh, a lot of resources online on the GB Philatelic Society's website, gbps.org.uk, and the, um, the there's a series called the Fisher Brown books which were developed a long time ago but they've been brought into the 21st century by uh, online methods and that's available on the GBPS website. Um, there are a number of other books but I think um, ask Bill when uh, depending upon exactly what it is you're collecting and Bill will help you out. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 these discs of the imprimatur sheets are available. You know, and they, Not expensive. You know, you know, a, 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 a full digital download is available. And th th they are the key plating resource. Because if, 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 if you, you know, the, the key to plating is, is looking at the position of, of the, the, the check letters in the lower squares. If you've got a, a very, you know, misplaced check letter, it's a lot easier to plate. And it's all there on the pictures. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. I hope that's helpful. Um, a few more questions here, and we do have time for them. So, um, uh, again, from someone who hasn't left their name, they just say, um, absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you, Bill and Mike. <laughs> um, I would like to ask you about how you store your gold medal winning collections. Do you have a temperature humid humidity controlled safe? Bill, I presume, where do you store your... Oh, I, I store it, I store it in a box on the top <laughs> shelf <laughs> in a very secure <laughs> environment. Brilliant, I hope that... It's as simple <laughs> that as that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's away from light, Mike. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just, Perfect. Uh, I mean, um, I, I've, I've got some, you know, some very interesting stuff, and I, I look—I really do look after them. You know, that they are—they are mounted 
uh, in archival quality mounts on archival quality paper in archival quality uh, plastic, not plastic, but archival quality um, enclosures. In, in, in enclosures. Okay. Um, so, a couple more questions uh, for you, Bill. Bill, um, has there been any thought to photographically, digitally adding the imprimaturs that were cut off the sheets? Uh -huh. uh, these singles well, in that, that would be a great idea. That would be a great idea because, you know, it's so frustrating if you've got a stamp from, say, die one plate 22, I think it is, where there is no imprimatur sheet. You know, so you've got nothing, you've got no visual starting point and if you get the a and the t rows um it's very difficult now i'm gonna kind of also gonna bounce that onto mike because he's the plater um what's the chance I, of, of... I, it, it is a possibility that at one point in time they might be added but um people should know that there are uh, resources again online for students who want to know what these so-called missing imprimators look like and again, come to Bill and he'll direct you to via me if necessary, but we can point you in exactly the right direction. There is a lot of information available online these days. 20 years ago, none of it was available, but there's so much more today. Well, what Mike is referring to is there is a website that actually illustrates the missing imprimatur images. Yeah which is, you know, it's, I guess what you want, you know, and I, 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 I'll be pleased to direct you to that. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. And I hope that helps. Um, so these questions uh, keep on popping up. Um, how much is the fullest of imprimatur sheets on disc? Sorry, how? How It just says how yeah. from Louis. How, how much? much? The, the, yeah. the, 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 the download, 45 quid. Is it, is it 45 per, per group? Per group. Okay. It's, 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 it's 45. It, it, it's 45 for the whole download, which is, hope, you know, for, 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 what, for what you get is, is nothing. It's nothing. Brilliant. Um, yeah, that's a nice, easy question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is from Jeff. Are there any records of sheet numbers sent to the Channel Islands post office? Offices, post offices. Which period do we know? Jeff, if you can just leave us a, a note in the Q and A with regard to which periods and any more information, we will come back to you. Should we? Should we do that? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I have no knowledge on that at all. I mean, I'm not a Channel Island specialist, and I'm not aware as to whether there are records of number where the sheets were actually sent. That's an interesting point. Now, I, 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 to be quite, I can't answer that. I really, I know. sorry, sorry, Jeff, can't do. Oh, Jeff has just written blacks and reds, Jeff. I think the only thing that you might do would be to compare the populations of the um, Channel Islands with the populations of the country as a whole and make some sort of best guess estimate um, on that basis, on the assumption that the use of stamps in the Channel Islands was the same as the use throughout the rest of the country. But that's about the best I can think of. What I would say is that there is a, an amazing series of books produced by a French guy living in America. Uh, and he, he produced a whole series of six books which reproduced as many of the postal notices as he could find from either the, the, the formal postal notices as we saw in in my exhibit or notices that were released in the London Gazette which informed people of changes of postal rates. Now in that book there are some postal notices that tell you which towns received certain stamps such as the shilling embossed is being released in November 1848 or whenever it was and is going to certain towns so that you know that 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 that, that informa information may be there but it's I'm not aware of a postal notice that tells that information that's, that's mm. very helpful thank you Bill I think Jeff um Bill and Mike will be on um Bill Barrell's booth a it's booth a6 um after this chat so if you want to chat to them more um on the uh, in the chat room or ask them to direct message you then obviously you can get more um information there if that if that helps you um 
I've just got two more questions. I think we've just got time for these two. We're um, quite quick. Um, Winston Williams, he just says, Bill, this is with regard to a fact that you've um, put in your, uh, your presentation, Bill, so I'm not too sure if you'll have, have the answer off the top of your head, but you give a percentage of free mail, as I think you said, not exceeding 12.5%. Yeah. The, re the report from the Select Committee on Postage, first report of 1838, would suggest 8.6% across the totality of letters. Uh, what is the source of your 12.5% figure? I don't I, know if you know. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I, the source came from, I believe it was on the Royal Mail National Postal Museum website. I think, uh, I'm pretty I sure on that. that. I hope Which that is helps. where that, that, that amazing image of Roland Hill's picture They've got yeah. the, the, the Postal Museum website hasn't got a lot of information, but it's got some very interesting data on it. And I've got a feeling that's where I pulled it from. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, quick question for Bill from a gentleman called Brandon. Um, is there anybody out there who mounts stamps up for display purposes? Mounts them for dis know. display purposes? Uh, professionally. Um, not really. No, I mean, at the very, at the very, very highest level, if you are a very wealthy collector uh, and you're a very busy person, I suppose, then you can employ someone to mount your exhibit. Brilliant. That's the, that's the only service. But, but hey, hey, Brandon, there's a gap in the market for you. Go for <laughs> it. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I sat at, I, I used to work for Stanley Gibbons and I left Stanley Gibbons in, in 1984. And, I thought, hey, there's a gap in that penny red market because there weren't many people dealing in it, you know, and there was a gap in the market. I went for it. And 30 years later, you know, I, I, it's, I've got this amazing business messing around with stamps on a day to day basis, traveling the world. So, you know, if you want to get into stamps, you know, f find that gap in the market and go for it. Brilliant. Thanks, Bill. I hope that helps, Brandon. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much for all those questions. Thank you so much, Bill and Mike, for joining us. That was absolutely excellent. Um, don't forget, everybody, um, Bill and Mike will still be on Bill Barrell's booth. So if you've got any further questions or just want to go and say hello, um, that is booth A6. Um, thank you, gentlemen, and have a really good evening. Thank you very much, Isabel. That's, that was a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>